Well, we welcome you to this new series that we're kicking off today titled Unshaken. Tell your neighbor, I'm not shook at all. I'm not shook at all. Tell them whatever's going on, I'm not shook at all. I'm not shook at all. We're going to be dealing with, I see some great friends, amen, that just got, caught, caught me by surprise. Um, we're going to be dealing with this series over the next eight or so weeks, and we're going to be jumping in the book of Daniel, which we're going to find there's a lot of parallels between the book of Daniel and what we're dealing with today. My aim is to help you thrive through adversity and to not negotiate your Christ during crises, Okay. That's my goal. My goal is to help you. And my goal is to help you thrive through adversity and not to negotiate or compromise your Christ through crises. Amen. How many can say this might have been some of the most difficult times of my life, but God is faithful, isn't he? See, we know and understand that we are living in unparalleled times. I mean, we don't even know that if our phone gives a notification, if it's going to be bad news or bad, bad news. It used to be a possibility of good news. Now it's bad or bad, bad news now. I mean, even on Mondays when I get a notification from one of the news outlets, which I subscribe to, one of the many, I always cringe because I don't know what's going on in the domestic marketplace or in the international marketplace. I don't know what has happened overseas. I don't know what has happened on our own home front. I mean, every week it seems to be something further catastrophic and further difficult than we can wrap our minds around, right? Am I right about that? I mean, from shootings in Las Vegas to earthquakes in Mexico to to the craziness we're dealing with throughout America, we just don't know. We we don't know if it's going to be a flood. We don't know if it's going to be a tornado. We don't know if someone else is going to get killed. And then check this out. We don't know if we're going to scroll through our social media outlet timeline and see someone die live. I mean, brutality is broadcast like it's truly for ratings. And we don't know, we don't know that our innocent eyes, our innocent minds can oftentimes be bombarded with the unexpected. And so the question I have for you is, what do you do when you're going through moments and times and seasons that you just can't quite predict? You can't get in your zone. You can't get comfortable. You seem like every moment, everything that comes to you moves you a degree here or a degree there. You just can't quite nestle in. What, what do you do? You said an earthquake has the ability to shake our foundations of security. A tornado can blow a lifetime of treasures away. A madman, a terrorist bullets can change both the future and history. I mean, let's be honest. Aren't we on alert even more now about outside venues than ever before? I mean, are we looking around and it's not the typical people we're looking for. It's guys we don't know. It's gals we don't know that might at any moment pop off. We just don't know. You see, and it needs not be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. When crises happen and when adversity gets to a place where it's beyond your ability to reconcile it emotionally and mentally and psychologically, we often ask this question. God, what you doing? Why did this happen? Why is the foundations being shaken by evil? Why is it seem, why does it seem like that, that that's bad every time I turn around? Maybe we need to start reconsidering that it might be God allowing the foundations to be shaken. You see, I, I, want you, I want you throughout this series over the next eight weeks, I don't want you to lose focus. I, I don't want you throwing what's valuable overboard. You see, I, I know you need to throw some stuff overboard, like some bad habits, some bad ideas, maybe a person or two in your life that shouldn't be in your life. But we don't want you to throw that which is valuable, proven and substantive away. I want you to thrive in every area for which God has called you to. We would all agree. We would all agree. That this, this society we living, that we're living in, it's, it's not healthy. It's sick. Like this society is in the ICU unit. It is, it is right now. We are pumping morphine into this society. We're just trying to stop the pain. I mean, we're living in a day and time where people turn on each other without any precipitation. Social media is making enemies out of traditional friendships. People are hurting and we get to see it on social media live because people are bleeding out. They are hurting. Nothing is celebrated within the context of family anymore. We live for likes and loves. We get hoodwinked easily by sexy marketing schemes and self-proclaimed experts who might say, 
I've made it, but I don't have any substance to prove I've made it. But I'm going to keep saying I made it, and I'm going to hope you to believe one day that I made it. Greg Holder, in his book, begins to show us in the genius of one. He says there is something that is coming against our unity. And he calls these forces, these forces of darkness that are, that are trying to stop our God-shaped and our Jesus-shaped and God-reflecting way of unity for which he calls us to exist. I mean, even today, we look for the wrongs in people so easily. We are looking to isolate ourselves from people so easily. Now, I get that we ought to have boundaries, but it seems today we get happy when we cut somebody off and yet we want a 60 year marriage but we celebrate cutting people off everything in this world seems to be in this day and time in this in this moment seems to be turned inside out i could go i could go the book of revelation with you i could deal eschatology with you i could tell you that first peter deals with this i could tell you that paul deals with this in second timothy and first Timothy. i could tell you i could tell you that jude deals with it i could tell you that that that, that there's a word that is going to mess you up and you're going to you're going to put a wall up as soon as i say it here's what it's going to i'm, I'm going to give you a phrase we are living in the last days. see your wall went up because you heard it in the 60s and you heard it in the 70s and you heard it in the 80s and you got cool in the prosperity of the 90s and you said he ain't came back all my mama had me do is believe in the sky was gonna crack open one day but I'm here to tell you all there are some significant there's some significant parallels to what scripture talks about in the end times to what we're dealing with now and no I am not going to make all the extrapolations today because it's too sensitive but you would not be wise to walk tomorrow throughout the day without recognizing that God is moving the clock a few seconds ahead of its normal time. That I don't care how you put it, that there are some things that are scriptural parallels to what we read and have read as the end times. Now, I'm not here to spook you because if you're in Christ and if you're not, you can still interview with him and you can sign on the dotted line. But I'm not shook. I'm, I'm not shook. You see, uh, Isaiah actually mentions this. And I'm going to give you a few, few scriptures that's going to flop on the screen here. That's not in your handout. So don't lock me in right now. I, Isaiah mentions this. This is what he says about his day and time. Now, let's see if there are any parallels. In Isaiah 5 and 20, he says, you are doomed if you call evil good. And call good evil. Destruction is certain when you call darkness light and light darkness. When right is considered wrong and what's wrong is considered right. When you claim what is bitter is now sweet and what is sweet you now call bitter. The world is inside out, isn't it? Upside down. See, uh, uh, Isaiah says... You're going to collapse if these are the realities of your day and time. Now, what's interesting is Daniel is the prophet that lives out Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah's prophecies. Daniel is the living prophet of the three previous prophets, major prophets, that tell the people of Israel and Judah, hey y'all, let's get our act together because we got this feeling and God ain't quite happy with us although we are the monotheistic people of Yahweh he ain't happy with us and if we don't change our idolatrous ways and if we don't change this uh, forsaking God well, God's going to do something and they were like oh man God, God man, my mama told me God's gonna do something I ain't did nothing yet man I ain't following none of that stuff y'all talking about I ain't dealing with none of this whole religion and then people get real bent on finding new ways of expressing their spirituality when you get to that place where there's no longer a fear of God y'all know the same God that got you through when no one else knew what you were going through and you prayed to him the one you now call fake the one you now call ain't real the one you now say ain't all that anyway and I don't need to honor him the one that got you through college through midterm through final the one that got you through your certification the one that got you through the hospital surgical procedure and there was nobody but got the one that rem the one that put into remission the cancer the one that put into remission the diabetic seizures you remember him 
the one you called on and you said Lord in the name of Jesus you didn't say in the name of trees you didn't say in the name of alkaline you didn't say in the name of crystals you didn't say in the name of soil you didn't say in the name of car you didn't say in the name of energy you said in the name of Jesus because if you want somebody's attention call them by their name not to the unknown God but to the one we know who has proven himself historically in our lives can I ask you by way of interviewing you this morning if you would be my live poll how many can say that God who has been revealed to you through scripture has shown up in your past now hold on to that hold on to that hold on to that hold on to that Mother Wiggins got something she'll tell you. She says, it was nothing but God that kept me through these years. Oh, God. And Mother Hawkins would tell you, and she would just rejoice and tell you, it was the Lord that made a way out of no way for me. Oh, my God. See, we got some folk who have history with God. Minister Wicks would tell you, it was God that kept me here. It was God that held back death and kept me here. You see, my brothers and sisters, when we start turning evil into good and when we start turning bitter into sweet, we're headed for disastrous times. Uh, we're here. We're here. Let's, let's be honest. We're here. We just got conditioned to it. We, we're used to it. We, 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 we don't mind TSA, but I remember the day you didn't have to go through no screenings. I, I, I remember the day you had to walk on the tarmac to get in the airplane. The, 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 uh, you, uh, unfathomable stuff we see. I remember you could go to the airport and people watch. Now it's what's your business here? Move your car. You've been here for 2.5 seconds. Well, I'm loading my bags. Move. You have, you have extended your limit of 2.4 seconds. <laughs> it's almost like you need to tell the people dropping you off. Okay, open the door. I got my bags in my hand. <laughs> I'm going to jump out. <laughs> you keep rolling. We're living in unparalleled times. We're living in times where we are conscientious of everything going on around us. We now don't necessarily look at the person in our cubicle or in our community of cubicles at work as being uh, just normal Sally anymore. We now got eyes on them. <laughs> Data log 101. Sally came in quite depressed today and said she's shooting somebody after work. <laughs> and we going straight to the FBI. We like, I'm telling. <laughs> We're living in, in, in a day and time where, you, you, you know, I don't know if y'all have this experience, but I, I, just me, it's just me. But when people have limo tent on their cars and they do crazy stuff on the road, I just, I, I, my heartbeat goes up a little more because I, I don't know what they got no more. It used to be you could get, give a person a look for driving crazy. Not anymore. I'm like. <laughs> I, I, I just sing a lullaby because I struggled for years with <sighs> road rage. I got it honestly. Didn't we, Cedric? We got it honestly. We, my dad was an avid road rager. We got it honestly. And, 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 and now, I mean, you could do crazy stuff in front of me. I'm like, well, Lord, I thank you. <laughs> We're living in unparalleled times. See, see I want to share with you all in Isaiah 5 and 20. This happened 2,600 years ago to the nation of Israel. The nation had fallen into immorality, to injustice, and to idolatry. Does any of those sound familiar? Idolizing things that aren't God. Treating people unjustly, uh, unfairly, and rampant immorality. In Psalms 82, it's called the Psalm of Asaph. David didn't write this psalm. I'm going to give it to you. This is for free. But this is something that's going to express his grievance of the people of his day. And I want you all to play, co play close attention how the Bible is so powerfully parallel and so powerfully uh, uh, correlated with what I'm about to share with you. This is going to mess you up, and I'm going to go there, okay? I'm going to go there, all right? Thank you so much for letting me go there. 
It says in Psalms 82, 1 through 5, go ahead and throw that up if we can. Is that, is that yeah, okay? No, no. The, uh, the whole verse, I believe. If not, I'll read it. God presides over heaven's courts. There we go. Y'all got it. Thank you so much. God presides over heaven's court and he pronounces judgment on who? He, he, he's talking about those in Israel's day, though. He's saying, y'all think y'all because y'all have a certain level of access and, and, and degrees and because you are hiding behind laws of the land that the just judge ain't going to judge the judge. Okay, okay. Um, then he says, Asaph is saying, how long, check this out, will you judges hand down unjust decisions? And show partiality. The, the, the word partiality there uh, is it, literally meaning prejudice or racism. Now, I know you, you all are squirming like, well, he'll go with this. Well, he'll go with this. I'm just telling you what was there before you got here. I just happened to read it. He says, how long will you hand down unjust decisions and show partiality? How long are you going to be prejudiced? Give fair judgments to the poor. And to orphans, uphold the rights of the oppressed and the defenseless, which is just the opposite of what's happening today. I mean, we won't even go into the whole uh, legal Ponzi schemes of many of the municipalities in the Metro St. Louis area, where they literally oppress people with ticketing and, and checkpoints and keeping people in the system of penalties and violations where they become, uh, they become redundant in the, in the legal system where this mother who does not have $555 to get out of the loophole, she has no money to get out of it, so she keeps getting warrants for her arrest in hopes that one day she will be able to escape it if she moves to another municipality, but not knowing that when she fills out the occupancy permit, it deans back to the system and then it sends them to that door and now that mother of four has to deal with now jail time but while her kids are left untended to and and, and it gets even uglier God says I see this and I'm doing something about it God says I see this and I'm doing something about it to all of those who, who, who have profited off the oppression of the poor from all of the, you know, call me if you got a, DW, a DUI, if you call me if you got court problems and all of these quick fix legal schemes that says all it takes is 99, 99 and I'll wipe all of it out. And then they get you in with the 99, 99 that says, well, your situation requires a little more investigation. So it's going to cost you 375 plus penalties that you owe the legal system. I want to go on and read because y'all already like, uh oh, uh oh. Look what he says. It says very clearly, rescue the poor and the helpless and deliver them from heartless evil people. Because the leaders are foolish and they lack understanding. People are living in dark times. Who, 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 who are foolish? Leaders. I'm not going there. I promise you, I'm not going there. I'm not. I, I, God help me. I'm not going. There. I said I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm not. God help me. But God says there's a time where we call out foolish leadership for what it is. Foolish leadership. Maybe this is the calm before the storm. Oh, I said it. I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going there. Notice what it says. And I want, and, and this is what I want you to get, and all the foundations of society are shaken to the core. Does that sound familiar? Foundations are shaken to the core. That sounds like Asaph and Isaiah peeked into the future of 2017, 18, 19, and 20 and said, I just want to shout with y'all that what went on in our time is going to happen in your time as well. Because anytime a nation falsely, falsely proclaims to be a nation under God, yet it's divisible. <laughs> With no unity and no justice for all. Let's call it what it is. 
and the nation has this moniker which is making a lot of people mad how can you be a nation under God and a Christian nation and you doing this stuff which makes people who don't know that everything that says they are Christ aren't Christ they get mad at the surface presentation and say I'll have nothing to do with your Christ because your nation says it's under God and it's Christian and yet it's doing all this evil in the name of your God and I'm going to tell you that some of them people if not many God is going to say I never knew them you can't walk in unrighteousness and injustice and you can't walk around oppressing the poor and giving people who are evil a pass and then say I'm blessed of God so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Now, I know I got your attention for a little while longer. I promise you I'll get y'all home. I promise you this. We're living in a day and time where everything around us is being shaken. The economy is being shaken. How we interact with other people is being shaken. Family structures are being shaken. And we, 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 we find the same thing with Daniel. With Daniel, D- Daniel um, which is why we're dealing with this book, is that Daniel, 25 centuries ago, saw everything we're seeing today. He he saw everything we're seeing today. In fact, in Daniel 101, which is at the top of your handouts, this is what it says. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and did what? Imagine waking up one day and you see thousands of of the enemy's forces standing at your gate saying, "Uh, yeah, this is how this is about to go. You, you, you... (laughs) Uh, yeah, yeah, y'all might as well just kind of wave the white flag. It's over. And he wakes up one day and he's like, wow. Here's why we're dealing with Daniel, because Daniel could have despaired. He could have become godless and idolatrous. Y'all know how we get when we go through something we didn't expect. God ain't real. I prayed for something different. God didn't answer me the way I wanted to answer. Daniel said none of that. He didn't despair. He didn't throw his God out the window with the adversity. He didn't throw his Christ out with his crisis. Uh -uh. Instead of giving in or giving up, this courageous young man held fast to his faith in God. He had this sense that even though adversity is on my doorstep, God is still in control. And somehow God's going to work through the adversity to bring out the promises he made to us a long time ago. I want to share with y'all before I go further, before I go further, because now, as I've said to you before, and some of you all before, that I believe every preaching now cannot just be lead us to the cross, but lead us to history. So I'm going to defend the book that we're going to be in for the next eight weeks with archaeological proof. I'm not showing you on the screen. I'm going to give you the opportunity since you're on your phone anyway. You can Google it. <laughs> see, see. Daniel and what he mentions is mentioned in this artifact that was dug up a few hundred years ago that is now in the Britain Museum called the Tablets of Babylon. And these long tablets have some interesting writings. It's in Aramaic and in Babylonian. Aramaic, of course, is the language where Jesus actually spoke as well. It was the language of the Mideast, which is what we know it, at large. Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned as the king. We see Daniel mentions Nebuchadnezzar, which gives it historical accuracy. Well, praise God. From 605 B.C. to about 560 B.C., we see this reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Wow. This called the Babylonian Chronicles, all these tablets that's in the Museum of Britain. And guess what it mentions in 605 B.C.? Whoa. Daniel mentions the same time frame. Furthermore, it mentions something further. It says that there was that was the master of eunuchs that was assigned over these 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 what we now know as the Hebrew boys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It mentions in the Babylonian Chronicles that the master of eunuchs were over all of the talented boys from nations they conquered. Daniel mentions that as well. 
Furthermore, furthermore, let me give you a few more things that I think are very important for our reading. In Daniel 1, 3 through 4, during the invasion of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, gives us these instructions, the master of eunuchs. But even further than that, further than that, it is known that how Nebuchadnezzar would come into a land and conquer it, he would send his army out and he would give them two choices, submit or surrender. Many of the kings, it mentions this in the Babylonian Chronicles, would send huge down payments, bribes, payoffs to him because his army was so feared and vast and many of them would just bow before he ever got there. And what he would do, mentions this in the Babylonian Chronicles, not the Bible, right? In the Babylonian Chronicles, it mentions this, that when he went to a nation, he would plunder the nation of all its wealth and successful bright people. He would leave the poor people behind with the land that has been lambasted by his armies. He would say, now y'all survive the best way you can. I got your gold, I got your silver, and I got the smartest people in your community. That's exactly what Daniel talks about. It says that right there in the first chapter of Daniel. It says, and he took the best and smartest with him back to Babylon and left the rest in Jerusalem. This is the Babylonian Chronicles, not the Bible. It's amazing how the Bible parallels with the Babylonian Chronicles and any right historian and, 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 and sober, sober debater has to give credence to history. This is archaeological. This is factual. And now the Bible lines up with it, which means now what we're reading is not a man-made myth, but historical fact. And now we get to see how God worked through historicity, through a man by the name of Daniel, through the nation of Israel. Now, y'all ready for more? Praise God. Because now I've gotten your attention that you should listen for a few reasons. One, what Daniel went through, we're going through. Two, there is historical evidence to prove that the book of Daniel is real, true, and accurate. Which leads me to this whole idea is that what we're going to do today, and I'm not going to go all the way into Daniel. I'm going to just kind of put my foot into it just a little bit, kind of how you test the water to see if it's cold or hot. I'm going to put my foot into the water just a little bit, and then over the next few weeks, we're going to dig right into it. But today, I want to give you a general context that I believe will help us deal with adversity and these unparalleled times. I want to ask you something. What should you do when your life is upended? When your world is shaken up by death or divorce or failure or bankruptcy or a hundred other things that could possibly go on in today's time when you're upended. What what should you do? Well, today I want to share you some things, share with you some things you can do. The first thing, and you have it there already outlined, is that because I want y'all to pay just close attention as you can, is don't be surprised by adversity. Tell your neighbor, that's why I'm not shook. 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 I'm not shook at all because I've been through enough to know that this too. (laughs) How many know that the forecast of every storm, of every storm, is that it must pass over? (laughs) And that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful meteorological argument that says no matter what you're going through, it too shall pass. Although Daniel is dealing with the collapse of a nation and although Israel is, 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 is in some sense shocked, it didn't shock everybody. It, it, was, it, it wasn't unexpected because remember Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesied this was going to happen. Because the prophets already gave them, this is what God is about to do. That some of them who believed the prophets did not, were not shook by the information they heard. Here's what you need to know about life. And I want you to get this in your heart and heart and mind that when you're going through adversity, don't lose your freedom. Don't go into idolatry. Don't run to other stuff. If your Jesus ain't good when you're going through bad times, then just dismiss him when you're going through good times as well. Or let me flip it because sometimes we get, we get we, what I'll call, we get, we get a prison salvation. When we're in tough times, difficult times, we all of a sudden get so converted to God. Lord, if you get me out of bankruptcy. Lord, if you stop them from coming to get me. Lord, if you get me out of this diagnosis. Lord, if you help me out this tight bind, I'm going to love you. I'm going to worship you. I'll never miss church. We get out the bind. Oh, God, I was lying. 
I was lying. I'm sorry. It ain't going down like that. I'm going to kick it like I never did before. Me and Hennessy are going to have some fun on, on with Coca-Cola on the top. See, my brothers and sisters, I want you to know something about adversity. Look what 1 Peter 4 and 12 says. Dear friends, don't be shocked or surprised when you suffer through painful tests and trials as if something strange is happening to you. I, I want y'all to know that he is saying here that shakeups are normal. Shakeups are normal in this broken world. We, we don't live in heaven, y'all. We, we don't live in the consistency of heaven. We're going to have more shakeups down the road than you can imagine. Listen, the, heaven has no tears. Heaven has no sorrows. Heaven has no sickness. But this broken world does. So we shouldn't expect things to be perfect here on earth. Every day it's not going to be perfect. Tomorrow's not going to be perfect. That's going to be shake-ups and shakedowns. Foundations are going to be moved. And you may be asking yourself the question, why me though, preacher? Why I got to go through suffering after suffering? And you need to start asking the question, why not me? He's already warned me that I shouldn't think it's strange when I go through tough times, but that he is faithful even through my tough times. Here's what Jesus said. Check what Jesus said out. He says, in this world, you will experience difficulties. Now, I want to show that to every Christian here who feels like they should have a bed of roses theology. Jesus himself says, don't be surprised when you, the, bl the blessed prayer warrior, when you, the blessed giver, when you, the blessed volunteer, when you, the person who has given their heart to Jesus, go through tough times. He says, don't, 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 don't think it's, uh, don't, don't. He says, in this world, you will experience difficulties. Don't think it odd, but take heart. He says, I've conquered the world. I've told you this so that in trusting me, yeah. you will be unshakable and deeply at peace. Yeah. Now, I could theolog theologically give you at least four sources of your problems. And I could tell you uh, sin is a source of problems because wherever there's sin, there will be a problem because someone's going to do something crazy. Because they listen to the devil all day long. All right. A sin, our own tendency to be evil. Then that's the devil himself, who a lot of us have blamed the devil on stuff that he had nothing to do with. Um, but there is a possibility that he has something to do with some of the stuff in your world. But not everything that you said he did, he didn't do. Some of the stuff you did yourself. That's called sin. Okay. Uh, we can say other people, you know, beyond our control. But I'm going to tell you one of the number one areas I found that tends to cause our worlds to shake and cause us problems is you, you, and you. <laughs> See, I, I know you don't want this, but this is going to help you out because sometimes we want to say it's someone else's fault, but you played a part in that equation. Don't, don't, please, 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 please don't play like you are totally and completely immaculate, that you had nothing to do with what went on to some degree in your adulthood life. Quit playing the victim. Nobody wants to hear that violin. No one wants to hear that rap song. No one wants to hear that soliloquy. No one wants to hear you get pull out your, pull out your violin and pull out your harp and talk about woe is me and nobody knows the trouble I've gone through. We get it. All of us have some stuff. We would love to just sit on someone's couch, but it's going to cost us some money to sit on some couches that's going to help us. That's why some of us go to Facebook because we think we're getting therapy by telling everybody what's going on in our world. You ain't getting therapy. You're getting an audience. And they sitting back there, oh, this is good. Oh, this is a, they're getting close to something here. Oh, 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 juicy, juicy. Oh, did you see what she said, girl? Screenshot it and send it to me. All right, hold on. You're not getting help. When we get to the place where we own our stuff and we say, I'm not, I'm not even going to act like I shouldn't have some adversity in life. I, 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 I want to share this idea with you, and maybe this is something we can talk about next year, but seasons. To everything, there is a season. And, and one thing y'all know is that seasons have to change. That, that no matter where we are on the planet, 
there are seasonal changes. Not everyone gets all four seasons. I think just the Midwest primarily and a few other countries in their certain parts get four seasons and some of them are shortened in certain capacities and lengthened in other capacities. And in, in, in Africa, when I was in South Africa last year and we were walking through Harare and Zimbabwe there, uh, people had coats on and sweaters on and fleece on and we were burning up. <laughs> it was 98 degrees. For them, that's cold. They even said, it's winter. I'm like, well, I be. This is winter. In the mornings, it's like 80. And they're like, you want coffee? I'm like, no. I want cold, cold, cold water. Every Body has a season. Every one of us can look at a season and say that was a good season. If I were to preach seasons, I don't have time today and I will not insult your intelligence, nor your time. But I will tell you all, never look at a bad season without enjoying a good season. Never go through a bad season without expecting a good season on the tail end of it. Never get locked into the wrong channel where you're so programmed to what's bad in your life that you don't see what's good in your life. Don't allow trauma to get the best of you. We get it. We all go through tough. I refuse. I refuse. Listen, I refuse in my some odd years of living on this earth. And I ain't telling you because it ain't none of your business. But in my years of living on this earth, I refuse to be 35. And that ain't my age. But just let me at least enjoy it. I refuse to be 35 living as though something that happened to me in 23 is still happening to me at 30. I refuse to subscribe to a channel that does not say my God is still in control of my life. Whatever went down, went down. Whatever happened, happened. And if there are folk around me that want to bring that up as a disqualifier to who I am today, bump you, go down the road somewhere, find another channel. Because that's some folk right now. Well, you know, well, you know you. In fact, let's talk about you and what went on in your life when it wasn't so nice and you didn't have all that wonderful cover up to cover up what you did under the cover did y'all catch that okay good seasons are to be navigated not paused now that's quotable there seasons are to be navigated not paused because some of us wish that when the getting is good we could just press pause right there and we just stay there and that ain't how it works is it because for every mountain of glory there's a valley of testing and for every valley of testing there's a mountain of glory I want to share with you all that if you're going to succeed and thrive rather than just survive in a hostile culture, you need to look for way. You need to start seeing what God is doing beyond what is happening. So here's the second thing I want you to do. Look for ways that God might use it for good. What is it? Whatever you're going through, whatever the world is going through. How is God going to use this for good? Well, I believe everything that's happening right now is bringing attention to we need to reform our justice system. I, I believe that there are some things right now that God ain't letting go away. Have y'all just wished some stuff would go away? Like, go away now. And you see some stuff extending that you thought would have been died out by now. And, and, and that's, that folk are mad. Man, they are mad. People are like, no. And there is a righteousness to their anger. This ain't just throwing the victim card on the table. This is, this is wrong. And I'm not just going to sit there and go to my corporate job and clank coffee cups with you and act like hell ain't breaking loose outside. No, there is some stuff that is wrong and people are boldly calling it out. That is wrong. You are wrong. There is no safety for you because I ain't scared to tell you you're wrong. I mean, I know this is going to be such an extrapolation, but I was watching this movie that talked about concussions in the NFL. Yeah, remember that movie that with, uh, I think Will Smith was featured in it, and he was talking about concussions in the NFL and how the fact that the NFL refuses to deal with these players having uh, uh, post-football careers uh, ended and, and their lives traumatized, can't walk, can't talk, uh, all kinds of physical ailments, and they give these NFL players unguaranteed contracts, knowing 
knowing that one misstep will end their entire careers, which is crazy because the owners are making billions. Why, why is that a problem? Because in this particular movie, this one guy who is being interviewed about concussions, he says something that just it, it messed me up when it came out. He said, he said, do you not know that the NFL stole Sunday from God? I promise you it's there. I said, hold up. Whoa, 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 whoa. We just stepped over the line. We just stepped over the line and I was not bold enough to say it three years ago. But when statements like that become the heartbeat of what people's actions are, prepare for what God is about to do. Suddenly there's this dude named Colin Kaepernick. Who, who, who God just lets him get a fire under his belly. To start something. And right now, right now, the news channels are like, the ratings are down. Because yeah. people says, I ain't watching till you change. I'm not watching till you give these kids guaranteed contracts. I'm not watching until you deal with this injustice. I'm not watching until you yeah. get fair. And the owners are like, we're good. We got guaranteed TV contracts for the next three years. But the networks are like, we're not good. So we're paying you, but we're not getting what we intended to get from you. So that's this whole shaking that's happening. Because yeah, yeah. somehow this thing went over to the God atmosphere. And when something enters into the God atmosphere, I need to take you back to these top 10 of God. Y'all ever heard God top 10? He got top 10. Dave Le- David Letterman brought it out later. Okay, it's called the Ten Commandments. <laughs> And here's what he say as law number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But do y'all know what he puts before that? He says after that rather because I am a jealous. Have y'all ever had a jealous relationship? That's all I got to give you all. Imagine if a person who is broken in your life is jealous of you moving on past them. They waiting on anything to happen to you. The tire, that tire blew out on the highway. Did they die? <laughs> right now, we got, we, got, we got baby mamas right now who are still holding the baby's father in a mental prison and the child is 20. Yeah, we're we, we going to talk about that later because some of y'all, y'all, need to, y- y- y'all who are in the church world need to just repent. Like if that father is in that child's life in a healthy way, let that father, let that father be great. Let the father be great. You ain't all my life had to fight. Nobody's coming to interview you. You ain't getting in the front of Ebony. I know I offended some of y'all right now. You're like, you don't know. See, that's what I'm trying to get. Stop. Jealous lover. <laughs> I know. Please take this in light. Please take this lightly because some of y'all are like, I ain't never coming back. <laughs> Go talk about a little motorbug. I right, motorbug. You don't know what motorbug did to me. <laughs> motor. Motor went vroom, 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 vroom. <laughs> Down the highway. Whoa, told me going to get a Pepsi. I ain't came back. Vroom, 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 motorbug. Y'all like, oh my God, don't talk about that. That's unfair. (laughs) I done lost my whole (laughs) chance. That's so bad. It's so bad. I'm so bad. But I want to get this to you. I want to get this to you. God is a jealous lover. God is jealous. He see if the broken person you was in a relationship with could be jealous and they hide behind bushes. They cut an electrical cars. They never been to school for electrical engineer. <laughs> they taking pliers out their pocket, cutting electrical cars, never getting electrocuted because the jealousy and the rage gave them like some type of invincibility. They bleaching clothes, cutting tires, following you on your job, making fake Facebook profiles so they can friend you. So they can watch you, then send you this cryptic, I see you, you know. <laughs> Y'all 
I don't know nothing about that, right? Okay, good. Praise God. Everything I heard was a lie. <laughs> if people who are broken can do all that, imagine God being jealous. And when we put that thing over into God atmosphere, God will let that thing melt. That's when I tell some of you who are here, maybe this will bless you. I don't know. But if it took God for you to get it, it's going to take God for you to keep it. Okay. I want to share with you all the scripture that we've misquoted for years. Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm almost done. God says the plans I have for you are plans for good and not to harm you. They are plans to give you hope in the future. I want to share with you all. You cannot just quote that as your as your slogan scripture for your day. Because you have to also invite the other stuff that goes into this scripture. Here's what, here's what Jeremiah was saying to the people of Israel of his day. He was saying, hey, y'all, y'all know we've been warning y'all. Uh, Isaiah warned you. Ezekiel warned you. I've been warning you. I've been in jail. I've been slapped. Y'all been talking about me. They call me the weeping prophet. He says, I want to let y'all know. God says that I have some great thoughts for you. I ain't going to harm you. I got a plan for you to give you prosperity and an expected end. But you got to go through 70 years of suffering. He's saying that God still go do something, even though what you're about to go through ain't comfortable. He says, God has a plan for you in it. Now, that ought to make everyone around here just shout with truly happy Jesus juice. Because he says, no matter what is going on in the world, God has a plan for it. So all trouble is not the devil. God uses trouble to shake our own foundations. And he does it three ways. God shakes things up to inspect me. See, somebody, somebody said people are like tea bags. You never know what's in them until you put them in hot water. Sometimes God has to let you go through some hot water so you can see what's on the inside of you. In fact, in Deuteronomy 8 and 2, it says, God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years, talking to some people, to humble you, to test you in order to know what was in your heart. Whether or not you keep his commands, God will let you go through a shaking to inspect you. God is wanting you to see, I couldn't give you that job because you have pride and arrogance as a problem. I couldn't give you that relocation package because you would have got lost in translation. God has to allow trouble in our life because some stuff helps us to see what's on the inside of us. Amen, somebody. I know you're like, what in the world? God allows shaking and trouble also to not only inspect me, but to correct me. See, this is exactly what happened in the nation of Israel some 2,500 years ago. They had fallen into deep idolatry and God says, I'm going to, I'm going to cure you of this addiction. How? I'm going to let you go through some trouble. I'm going to get rid of those things and let you know that the only one and true and living God is worthy to be praised. When God allowed them to be hauled off by the Babylonians and then the Persians and and the Medes and so forth. Listen, 25% of the nation is hauled off. But listen what happened. 70 years later, they were cured of their idolatry. God corrected them by shaking them. The the nation of Israel never went back to idolatry because they learned from their previous years of mistakes. Like, I don't care what else happens. I ain't never leaving God again. They never went back to idolatry. God allowed trouble to correct them. In fact, Hebrews 12 and 8 tells us this. God corrects all of his children. If he doesn't correct you, then you don't really belong to him. So not only does God allow the shaking to inspect me, then to correct me, but then he allows it to direct me. See, God shakes things up to direct me. He, he, wants to, he wants to point you in a new direction. He wants to guide you down a different path. In fact, Proverbs 16 and 9, for all my planners, for all my planners, planners, all my people who got their five-year, 10-year, 15-year, and 20-year thing planned out, for all my people who said they should be pregnant by 31.5 years old, for all my people who said they should have two dogs, nine kids, a house in a certain zip code, and should be able to retire at age 48. I want to help y'all out because ain't none of that came to pass, has it? Okay, let's talk about that. (laughs) Let's talk about that. Here's the deal. A person may plan his own journey, but the Lord... I'm going to mess somebody up right now. You'll be real mad at me. Oh. The question I'll ask you is, how does God direct your steps? I'm going to answer it for you too. 
he sends trouble. Problems. Nothing changes your direction like a problem. You were, you were, you were all ready to relocate. Had it all figured out. Your job laid y'all. What? I, I had all this plan. God says, I ain't finished with you here yet. Had to put that on postponement. You wondered why in the world did God land you in the Midwest of all places? Have you wondered that? I did too. I did too. Out of college, I had so many people offering me so many jobs across the nation. And one of those jobs was in Dallas, Texas, you know, also known as Southwest St. Louis. <laughs> Some of y'all will catch that when you go home. So you just say you move and just say, you're going to Southwest St. Louis. <laughs> and and, and um, before everyone, it was popular, right? I was, I, was, I was interviewed by IBM. I was interviewed by IBM, and they, they came to me. And I, I'm, a, I'm a poor boy from East St. Louis. I'm, I'm at Mizzou, and, and they, I went through the interview process, and they said, we, we like you. And I'm like, oh, you like me? Well, what does that mean? They're like, well, what does that mean monetarily for me? You know, because I promised my daddy I was going to get him a Volvo. That's all he drove, Volvos. And they said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hire you for $50,000 base. I was like, oh, Jesus, thank you so much. You're so good to me. I went out of my business school um, class that day when I got the, the official offer letter. And I yelled it all down the you know, campus, <laughs> you know, talking to all my friends. Look what I got. I got this offer. I got this offer. Because, you know, if you didn't get an offer and you was in business school, it was like, you're a bum. Like, you know. <laughs> so, you know, everybody was, you know, rushed to get an offer. And I got a good offer. And then my dad died. I don't. See, for me, my dad was my hero. And for all of us who are his children, he was our, like, we, we, we just, he, there was no better man in the world. And, 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 and he, he was like the Renaissance man. He, he was college educated, born in 1928. He, he, he had 12 kids, you know, with, with my mom is here right now. It's the same woman. And he showed us Christianity and life and even in hardship how to make it. He had the ability to fix cars, build houses, lay concrete, and lay bricks. I mean, he built every house he lived in. He built it with his own hands. I mean, he was our hero. And when literally, my brother who is Cedric is here, when that morning came of January the 8th, I, I'll never forget it. January the 8th, that morning, he came to me. Cedric said, has daddy been up? I said, no, he ain't been up yet. And it was odd for him not to be up by 9 o'clock. And so Cedric goes into and breaks the door, gets into the room, and he sees daddy is gone. And we are in total shock. Our world is shook. We are like, whoa, no, not this. We was just talking to daddy last night. In the back of my mind, I'm like, this changes everything for me because I, we can't just leave mama out there. And I, I just can't go to Texas. I got to turn down this job. We got to keep my daddy's vision of this ministry alive. I don't know what I can be a pastor or not. In fact, I never wanted to be a pastor. Ever, 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 ever. God, I thank you. I love you. But don't ever call me in another life of this again. But truth be told, I wanted to be in the business world doing business kind of things. You know what I mean? I had that as my goal. And here is what God changed my direction. I call I called this guy up, the recruiter, who was also going to be my sales manager and told him I cannot accept your offer. He said, why? I said, because I need to take on and carry on my father's church. I felt called back to East St. Louis area, to the St. Louis metropolitan area. And he literally cussed me and said, you are some kind of fool. I said, well, I got to be a fool then. It hurt me to t hang that phone up. Let me fast forward real quickly because I don't want you to think it's a bad it's a soliloquy here. And so I come back home and, you know, we're trying to figure this church thing out. And we, we're down to two people, just me and my mom, you know, because the other 22 walked out on me because they said I was too young to pastor. You know, um, yeah, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. I'll give you what my therapist said about that later. 
and, and they walk out on me and, 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 they, they, they didn't, and so we got to figure out church. We got to figure we bankrupt. We like negative $500 in the hole. We owe the, we owe the bank money. And so we just struggling trying to figure things out and we would grow. We went up to seven people. Then we got to 15 people and I felt like I was well on my way to the next mega church. I mean, 15 people. I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to see what's happening next Sunday. And the next Sunday we're coming, we're down six. And we're like, what happened? They're like, oh, I don't like your church. It's too small. Or, you know, we didn't have all the accoutrements that people have today and desire today. You know, kids sit next to you, mama. They sit next to you. They, they, they sit next to you. They, they clown next to you. They yell next to you. And then how? No, we didn't have. We had one restroom. So, hey, you better figure it out. You know, um, and so we, we didn't have all the accoutrements. And so we're trying to figure this thing out, figure this thing out. And so finally, I, I just kind of put my head down and just like a football player, and just kind of run as hard as I can to get to the first down. Right. Because I'm like, God, this don't make no kind of sense why you got me here. And then I took a job at a financial institution that's no longer around uh, that Wells Fargo bought out. And I was hired for half the amount that the job in Texas offered me. So now I'm like, God, this is an insult to injury. I don't understand how I'm following your wheel, taking L's. Don't make sense to me. So I get this job. Finally, you know, I get done with seminary school. Never thought I'd be in seminary school. Like, who, who, who thinks that you're going to go and actually get a degree to be a pastor? Like, who, who does that? I mean, not in our culture. You just have a dream after White Castle's meal. And you come up with a whole, you know, idea with a color scheme and cards. And you, 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 you go to sleep a minister and you wake up a bishop. You go to sleep a bishop and you wake up an apostle. Just kind of how it works. You don't, you, you know, you just wake up. All of a sudden, oh, I'm a bishop. You ain't got nobody. You ain't got nobody. Even your wife don't go to your church. Your kids don't go to your church. You a bishop of what? You just on Facebook? You being a bishop of Facebook? You doing Facebook lives about how deep you are? You got a robe on? You're preaching to people you don't even know? Come on now. That's not a church. That's called malarkey. And so... Did I go there? I did. So real quickly, so I get this job at UPS. I'm, I'm in sales at UPS where I go and drum up business for the brown trucks to come. And, you know, we're fighting against FedEx. And at the time, DHL comes into the market and they're subsidized by the German uh, post office. And so they get an unfair advantage. And so we hustling hard, man. And our, our people are knocking us off. I said, go out there and get business, get business, get business. No problem. We're doing our thing. And I'm sitting next to this guy named Kevin, who is also new to the UPS, but he's got me beat by about a month. So we're training together, however. We're training together we're going through this whole you know you set the cubicle you go through all these sales analogies and you do all this stuff that they want you to do so they can sign off on stuff and so we get to talking of course as we do and I said man what brings you to UPS he says well I relocated here from Texas I said oh really I said man that's interesting I had a job offer in Texas he said how is Texas he says big I said gotcha I said well who were you working with he says IBM I said oh interesting I had an offer from IBM when I was in college, uh, when I graduated. I said, um, what's your sales manager name? He said the name. I said, that's the guy that offered me the job. He says, oh, you're the guy that he said was a some, some fool who turned down the offer and he called me and gave me your job. I said, whoa, dude, for real, this is real talk. I said, well, why are you here with me? He says, not even a year after I got hired, they dissolved the entire department. God sends trouble... I would have gone, listen, what we have today probably would not be here and I would have went from Texas to Cali because that's where I really wanted to be because I got this California style body and I believe I should be on the beach somewhere <laughs> strutting and walking. I just feel like I should just be like, you know, what's up? What's up? East Boogie in Cali, right? God used trouble to direct me from my modeling career. I mean, from my misdirection. <laughs> The last thing, and I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I promise you I'm done. The third thing I want you to get out of this is trust God for what you don't understand. Daniel, Daniel held on to Jeremiah's prophecy that this is going to be an expected end to this. Trouble won't last always. I, God, will, God will get the best out of this that I don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through, but I'm going to trust God for what I don't understand. Have y'all ever tried to figure God out and still can't figure him out? See, that's when you trust him. That's when you say, Lord, I trust you. That's what trust is. Trust says, if I don't trust you, I fall on my face. If I do trust you, I risk falling on my face. But I want to trust you even though I don't know what's next. I don't know why this is, but I trust you, which means I'm not going to A or B or C route. You are it. I ain't got no B or C or D alternative. You are my only option. 
look what look what Proverbs twenty twenty four says. Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that happens along the way? You're not going to get answers for everything. Not the answers you want. We want psychological, scientific answers to why something happened in our lives. God says, the answer I'm going to give you is me. That's it. I'm going to give you me. And in him is peace and direction. And this last scripture in Psalms 56 and 3 and 4, I want to help you all who are dealing with some stuff that you probably can't understand right now. He says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Anybody been afraid? Just truly you've been afraid. You don't know what's next. Let's stand all over the house. I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? I, I want y'all to do me a favor this week. I want y'all to take Psalm 56, 3 and 4. And I want you to wrap that around everything you do. God, I won't be afraid. I'm going to trust you. I'm not shook. I'm difficultly, I, I'm, I'm dealing with some difficulties. And I, I'm, I'm struggling with some difficulties. And I feel displaced. Anybody has felt like you've been displaced? Everybody else doing their thing? You know, Travis Green has this song. And in fact, one day we're going to talk about this song. You know, I ain't going to sing it. I ain't got it. But it's just, I was listening to it this morning. I promise y'all, it hit me this morning. I've been listening to it for the past four weeks. It's Be Still. And it starts off with something that didn't hit me until I was driving this morning. It says, everybody's moving. I said, did he just say, everybody's moving. Everybody's going. But no one is finding where God is. Then he says, be still and know that I am God. Can I tell y'all something that no matter how busy life gets and how you just want to run, 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 that's not the answer. Be still and know he is God. 